Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to get started. Welcome everyone to our macro invertebrate webinar. We're so excited to have stream teams from all over the Susquehanna region with us tonight. We're going to start with introductions from the alarm team. So hello, I'm Stephanie Letourneau, the community science specialist at alarm. You should know me by now and I'm the one who's been sending you many, many, many emails. And I'm going to pass it to Phoebe and then Ginny, you're on deck. Hello everyone, um, I'm Phoebe Gallione and I am Alarm's new outreach manager. Hi, I'm Jenny Monismith and I'm the Alarm staff scientist. Candy? Hi everyone, I'm Candy Wilderman. I'm the founder and now science advisor for Alarm. Um, I was, well, I'm a professor, retired professor of environmental sciences at Dickinson. And I'll pass it to Darcy. Hi, I'm Darcy Brownlee. I'm a senior at Dickinson College, um, and I work as a watershed coordinator on our outreach team. Michelle H. and then Michelle C. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Hom. I'm a watershed coordinator at Alarm and currently a sophomore at Dickinson College. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Cow, and I'm a first year and the newest watershed coordinator at Alarm. And then Kat. Hi, my name is Kat Dickman. I'm a senior at Dickinson and I am also a watershed coordinator for Alarm. Awesome. And then we're going to pull our PowerPoint up. And we're going to do our standard, uh, our standard introductions in the chat we're adding a twist on it. So please write in the chat your name, the county you're in, what stream you monitor, and your favorite aquatic organism. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna review some of our housekeeping reminders. So please feel free to keep your camera on. You can also turn it off to reduce um, any lag in your connection. Please remain muted during the presentation. We wanna reduce any feedback going on in the background. Uh, you are more than welcome to type questions and comments in the chat. I'll be going, down, going through and marking questions as we go so we can answer them at the end. Um, and please use the react buttons if there's anything that you wanna to react to or like. So when we go over some of the macros, I might share a heart because I love those macros. <laughs> And please feel free to show any enthusiasm in the chat as well for these macro invertebrates. All right, and while you're continuing to introduce yourselves into the chat, um, I'm gonna go over our agenda for the next hour and a half. So right now we're doing our welcome and introductions. We're then gonna review some of our workshop goals and the timeline. We're then going to dive in to an introduction of macroinvertebrates, including their life cycle, the ecosystem roles they play, and importance in our streams. We'll then do a deep dive into macroinvertebrate identification, and then we're going to do a brief overview of the collection methods for macroinvertebrates, but we're going to be in the field in the spring, hopefully, to do this, so it will not be very in-depth. Um, and we'll be in the field actually to review that then. And then we're going to provide some resources and activities for you to do to keep this information fresh until the spring. And we will have time for questions and answers at the end. And oh my goodness, we have so many introductions in the chat. I'm going to take a quick look and see where we've got everyone from. Lots of York County, some Dauphin, Lackawanna and Luzerne representing, Cumberland, Lebanon, awesome. All right, continue to share about yourself in the chat and get to know your fellow stream team members. And I'm gonna go over some of goals. So tonight our goal is to provide you as a monitor the background in macroinvertebrates that will assist you with the macroinvertebrate monitoring workshop. And we hope to do these workshops this spring. It's gonna be based on COVID restrictions, but as of right now, that is our goal. 
So tonight we are going to be focusing on the background identification, but we're going to be going more in depth than that in the spring. We're gonna actually be in the field showing you the collection, having you do that hands-on practice. We're gonna have interactive identification. We're gonna be actually there with you in the microscope and helping you figure all of it out. And then we'll do step-by-step -step training on how to calculate a water quality score for the site you're sampling. So please do not stress or panic if this feels like a lot of information and you don't feel like you can remember all of it for the spring because we will be reinforcing all of it in the spring together, hands-on, in the field, macros in hand. All right, and with that, I'm gonna pass it to Candy, who's gonna get us started on our macro adventure for the evening. Thanks, Steph. So let's start at the beginning. What are macro invertebrates? Uh, well, macro, as you know, means large. And in this case, it means visible to the naked eye, as opposed to micro, microorganisms that require microscopes in order to identify them. An invertebrate is an animal with no vertebral column. So macroinvertebrates are organisms that live in the stream that are visible to the eye, but do not include the vertebrates. Um, in streams, most of the macroinvertebrates are insect larvae. They're part of the insect groups that spend their larval life in the stream and then eventually emerge and they uh, spend their adult life terrestrially. Um, but in addition to those, to the, the insect larvae, we also have organisms that spend their whole lives in the streams, things like crustaceans, and there's a picture of a, um, of a scud there, mollusks like snails, and of course, worms. Next. So here's just some examples of aquatic <clears throat> insects. Again, the larvae are on the left and the adults are on the right. And you'll notice the adults are winged, the adults are, are terrestrial, they fly around, whereas the larvae are aquatic, they stay in the streams. The top row are mayflies, ephemeroptera, both the larvae and adult. The, cat the next row are caddisflies, trichoptera, and the other example we have are helgramite dobson flies. Again, the larvae, which is aquatic, and the adult, which is terrestrial. Next. Okay, so let's talk a little more about the life cycle and the development of these macro, of these, these um, insects. So um, there are two kinds of life cycles. One is called complete metamorphosis on the left and incomplete metamorphosis on the right. So let's start with the complete. If you start with the eggs, the eggs are laid by the adult in the water and the larvae hatch out of the eggs and go through multiple in stars where they, where they molt, they uh, shed their shells, so to speak, and they get bigger and they can stay in the water anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of years. Um, at some point they go into a pupil stage where they undergo tremendous changes, complete metamorphosis, and they emerge as an adult that looks very unlike the larvae. It's hard to match them up. That's complete metamorphosis. Incomplete metamorphosis is very similar. It's considered by some evolutionary biologists as a more primitive sort of metamorphosis, starting out again with eggs in the water, moving into the larvae, which in this case, an in incomplete metamorphosis, we call them nymphs. And again, going through multiple phases of the nymphs as they get bigger and bigger. And when they emerge, the adult emerges right from the nymph without going through any kind of pupil stage or any kind of major metamorphosis. It's, there's some metamorphosis there, but they look more like the larvae. You can actually connect the adult and the larvae pretty easily when it's in complete metamorphosis. Okay, next slide. So this is a stone fly, and we're going to show you the metamorphosis here. The, you can see the nymph has crawled up the tree and now the magic is about to happen. And if you watch closely, you will see. So you can see that how the adult is winged, but you'll see in particularly when it pulls out its posterior part, it looks fairly similar in lots of ways to the nymph and there it is. So that is the only 
um, Halloween horror movie that we're going to show you tonight. It, if, yeah, click on the slide. Yeah. Okay. So what role do macro invertebrates play in the ecosystem, in the stream ecosystem? Well, to understand this, you have to understand sort of the, the most basic principle of stream ecology. And that is that streams are what we call heterotrophic. Hetero means other, trophic means feeding. So in a sense, the system is fed from outside the system. So it's heterotrophic. What we mean by that, that streams are dependent for the majority of their energy on the import of leaves and other dead organic, what we call detrital matter. 99% of their energy, the source of their energy comes from outside the system, from the watershed, from the riparian buffer zone. All that material comes into the stream and drives the stream system. Only 1% of the energy supply comes from photosynthesis, you know, going back to the sun. And that actually happens within the stream with the diatoms and the algae within the stream. But it's a very small percentage of the actual um, energy that reaches the stream. So macroinvertebrates are actually the primary processors of all this detrital matter that come into to the stream. They figured out how to take the energy from this material and the, the carbon from this material and use it for their own purposes and to drive the ecosystem. And they all form the basis of the food chain. Next. Okay, so how do they do this? There's amazing adaptations, and this is why we love them so much, um, to be able to, to do this. And, and each macroinvertebrate sort of has their own way, their own feeding habit, their own way of doing this. To start out, we have the shredders. Um, and the shredders are things like stoneflies um, that actually have the ability to tackle the, the full leaf, the, full, the, the material as it first comes in there on the front line so to speak. And what they do is they take this coarse particulate organic matter and they chew it up and they break it into fine particulate organic matter, smaller pieces. They're not actually feeding on the leaf material itself. They're feeding on the microbial organisms that have colonized the leaf. Things like fungi and bacteria, that's where they're actually getting their energy. So they break it into fine particulate material and they send it downstream with the current. And downstream are the waiting, um, are the collectors. And there are various kinds of collectors and the diversity is just unbelievable. The caddis fly, the net spinning caddis fly that you see there um, actually builds a net. And when the particles come down, they get caught in the net and it simply goes around and feeds off the net, which is lovely lifestyle. And the, the uh, brush-legged mayfly that you see there um, has long, hairs on its legs and it forms its legs like a basket and it just collects and then eats off of what collects in its basket. Okay, so those are some, some ways, there's lots of other ways to collect. Um, grazer is, um, that's a mayfly there who eats the algae off of the rocks or scrapes the algae. So the grazer utilizes that 1% of energy that comes in through photosynthesis, through algal photosynthesis. There's a number of different grazers in the stream system. And then of course there are also predators. Macroinvertebrates actually prey on other macroinvertebrates. Macroinvertebrates eat other macroinvertebrates, so they're predators as well. So those are some examples of feeding habits. Next. Okay, so this, Hmm. Is that showing up properly for everybody? Not showing up quite properly for me. Hmm. Well, that is a net spinning cat caddis fly who is, I don't know. Phoebe, talk to me. Yeah, I'm trying to escape and get it to okay. a place where you can view it. Uh, if it's a prop, there we go. We'll watch it this way and then I'll turn oh. it back to the presentation mode. Okay. Okay, so this is a net spinning caddis fly. You can see its net is around the outside and it's in this little, little cave sort of thing. It goes around and eats on its nets and pulls back into its cave and 
eats the particles, the fine particulate organic matter that have been chewed up by the shredders and have moved themselves downstream. Okay, next. And then this one shows the black fly uh, larvae. Black flies are amazing. They, what they do is they sort of lie on their backs and they have these um, uh, cephalic filaments. They're, they're like arms on its head, kind of like, and they have little baskets at the end of them. And they just lie back there that, with their heads downstream and they just wait for the particles to come. And you can see when a particle comes, they just put, shove it into their mouth. And you can see those little caudal filaments going, you know, shoving things into their mouth. They hook on with little hooks on their rear under the substrate. And they're, you know, very, very well adapted for fairly fast moving streams. And um, they capture plenty of organic material that way. Okay, so. Okay, so let's review real quickly. We've got 99% of the energy source are leaves, detritus, uh, coming from the watershed itself, not from within the stream. 1% are um, algae, photosynthetic algae that are using, of course, the energy from the sun. And the shredders are the ones that take the detrital material and they chew it up, eating uh, the, the microbial organisms on the leaves, and they send it downstream for the collectors who know how to deal with the fine material. And then all of those guys together, oh, and there's the grazers that work on the algae on that 1%. And then all of them together feed the predators, the, the vertebrates, as well as other macroinvertebrates. So that's a simplified stream food web. And you can see what a critical role the macroinvertebrates play in processing all this energy and all this material. Next. Okay, um, macroinvertebrate communities also, they're dependent on the availability of appropriate habitat. Uh, even if the water quality is good, if the habitat's not there, they're not gonna be there. And they have managed to occupy all kinds of habitat. Um, silt, sand, and gravel substrate in riffle zones is where we're going to collect them, very common habitat. They snags and logs, aquatic vegetation beds, vegetated bank mar uh, margins. So they basically live just about everywhere. Next. So what threatens our macroinvertebrate communities? Well, there's water quality and there's habitat quality. The water quality is what, what you guys are doing, what you're monitoring, the chemical pollution that you guys are monitoring can be a threat to macroinvertebrates as well as thermal pollution or heat pollution, which may become more and more of an issue as, as we experience climate change. Habitat quality can also affect macroinvertebrates. Sedimentation is a big one. If sediment comes down, it coats the habitats, makes them unlivable. It also coats the macroinvertebrate gills, makes it difficult to live. Stream flow disruption, either too much water or too little water. Again, something we're seeing more and more with climate change happening. And then finally, the loss of the forest in riparian zone. We always talk about how important it is to, to restore the buffer zone around the stream. Remember, that's where the leaves come from. That's what drives the stream. If you mow up to the stream, you're removing the major source of energy for that stream. So that's very, very important. Next. So why do we monitor biological communities? Um, well, let's compare chemical monitoring for water quality indicators and biological monitoring. Chemical monitoring, monitoring provides only a snapshot or an instantaneous assessment of water quality. If you go out to a stream and you grab a sample um, and you measure nitrate, for example, you are getting a picture of what that stream looks like in that instant, in that moment. If 12 hours ago, there was a sewage treatment plant that discharged excess amounts of nitrate, you probably missed it because you weren't there at the time when it happened. The biological organisms on the other time, they, on the other hand, they have to live there all the time. And so they integrate water quality conditions over time and they give a longer term assessment of stream health. So if every 12 hours there's a, a discharge at midnight of nitrate, you're going to be able to tell by looking at the macroinvertebrate community that, that there's an impact, even if it doesn't show up in your chemical monitoring. So that's one of the advantages of, chemical, of, of biological monitoring. On the other hand, chemical monitoring is better at providing clues to what is actually what the source of the impairment is 
And we also have relatively simple field kits that are available for assessment, which is great. Biological monitoring may be more difficult to ascertain what's why they're impacted or what the source of the impairment is. And it requires more intensive training as you guys will experience soon. Okay, next slide. So why are the macroinvertebrate groups useful tools to evaluate the health of the stream? It's really quite simple. It's just that different groups of macroinvertebrates have different tolerances to pollution. So if you look at the chart on the right-hand side, you see there's three groups. Group one are the pollution intolerant species. Those guys are sensitive to pollution. They don't want to live where there are certain chemical parameters that they can't tolerate or where conditions are, are unfavorable. Group two are moderately pollution intolerant or moderately pollution tolerant. They're in between. And group three are very pollution tolerant. And so basically these are called indicator groups. And if you find a community that has a lot of group one, the, the sensitive ones in it, and a couple of the uh, members of the other groups, you can rest assured that that stream is not impaired, that that stream is doing well because those guys who are really sensitive can live there. Live there. On the other hand, if you get a um, sample where all you have are the pollution tolerant species or not very many of the other kinds, then it gives you clues that, that that particular stream is impaired. So the presence or absence of these indicator groups are really important in giving us clues to the health of the stream. And that's you know, why they're so useful to us. Next. We don't only worry about who's there, the indicator groups, but we also worry about how many kinds of groups there are, how many kinds of organisms. Um, that's because of sort of the basic principle of ecology is the higher the diversity in an ecosystem, the stronger and more resilient is the ecosystem. So if you put those two things together, basically healthy streams have a diverse macroinvertebrate community, which is dominated by organisms that are sensitive to pollution. Then you know you've got a class A stream, a healthy stream. Unhealthy streams have lower diversity, few kinds of macroinvertebrates, and they're dominated by organisms that are tolerant to pollution. So they're very, very useful critters to help assess the health of the stream. Next. Oh, and wait, yeah, one, thank you. One other thing I wanted to mention is that towards, when, when we collect our macroinvertebrates, we're going to come up, we're gonna calculate a metric, a single metric that is going to give us um, an idea of the health of the stream. And that metric is going to take into account both who's there, the indicator species, and also the diversity. And it's a fairly useful metric and as Stephanie's gonna talk about a little later in the talk. Okay, next. So the other reason we like to monitor background vertebrates is that it's feasible for volunteer groups. Um, they're easy to find. They're relatively easy to collect using volunteer-friendly protocols and inexpensive reusable equipment. And they're relatively easy to identify to the order level in the field using magnifying lenses and identification keys. Um, uh, Phoebe will talk in a moment about what we mean by order level. And you know, some, some of the, um, you'll get a sense of that. Um, I guess the other reason we, we do macroinvertebrate monitoring is because it's really fun. All right, next. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Phoebe at this point. Yeah, so at this point, we're now going to transition into the identification portion of the presentation. The macros that we're soon gonna be covering are going to be ones that are based off the scoring and identification sheet that you'll be using. And Stephanie will briefly introduce you to it later. Um, but as Candy just alluded to, we identify macros to the order level. But before we understand order level, it's important to understand everything that makes up order level. So we're gonna start at the most specific and get more broad. So the example that I found for you is the wolf because it's a um, charismatic species. Most people know what they look like. So at the most basic level is the species. And the definition of a species is um, any genetically similar individuals that are able to reproduce and produce viable offspring. So even though horses and donkeys can reproduce and create a mule, the mule can then cannot then reproduce. So they're not considered the same species because their offspring cannot reproduce. So as far as wolves go, um, they are Canis lupus. And from there, we're gonna move up to genus. So genus is um, a grouping of species with similar characteristics. So in the case of the wolf, their genus is Canis. 
And that now includes domesticated dogs, coyotes, jackals, a lot of species that share a lot of characteristics with the wolf, but aren't wolves. We move up again then to family. And family is a group of genera, which are the plural of genus with similar characteristics. So for wolves, um, Canidae then includes foxes. So we're getting a little further from the species that look like wolves. There's still some similar characteristics, but it's not quite as similar as dogs or jackals that we just went over. Um, and then we get up to order. So order is the level that we're concerned about um, and things are getting very pretty broad now. So as far as wolves go, their order name is Carnivora and that now includes mammals that have evolved primarily to eat meat. So not only are we looking at wolves and dogs, we're now looking at sea lions and lions and weasels. So the characteristics aren't shared as easily as they were when we were looking at the more specific levels down below. So this, this trend of grouping similar characteristics as we move up continues through class, phylum, until we get to the animal kingdom. And I thought it was important to mention that the only um, level here on the classification system that is strictly scientific is species. So species are based off of genetics and similar characteristics, whereas the ones as you move up are classifications that scientists have put together. So as new discoveries are made or as new species are discovered, um, those top ones will change, but species generally do not. So I thought that was important to understand, but hopefully this now gives you a little glimpse into what we mean by order. For example, soon, very soon, we're gonna be looking at mayflies. So I put a picture up here of a cookie headed mayfly, which I thought is fun because their heads look like cookies. Um, and for example, their order is Ephemeroptera. So when we were looking at wolves, um, there are characteristics that we generally were recognized to look like dogs. When we look at macroinvertebrates, there are characteristics that we'll look at, um, some of which being, do they have a shell? Do they have wing pads? How many jointed legs they have? Um, so we created a chart here with the macroinvertebrates that you'll soon be introduced to. Um, and it is a chart of how many legs they have. So it's interesting to look at these charts like this because although, let's see, if we look at it, there are a lot of species here that have six legs, so it won't be as useful to identify the six-legged ones. But if we found a macroinvertebrate that says has 10 legs, we would automatically know it was a crayfish based off of what we would likely find. So although the legs may be the most useful for crayfish, other characteristics that we'll be looking at will help you identify other macroinvertebrates. So the reason why we're doing this presentation is to give you those characteristics that you can look at depending on the macroinvertebrate. So we're now going to go into the specific macroinvertebrates. And the first group that we're gonna to go to is often um, abbreviated as EPT, which is Ephemeroptera or mayflies, Plecoptera or stoneflies, or Trichoptera or caddisflies. So EPT is generally put together because they are sensitive species for the most part, and they are used very often to assess the health of the stream. So the first group that we're gonna to go to are these three, and I'm going to hand it off for the first macro ID. Woohoo! So the first um, macroinvertebrate we're going to talk about are the mayflies or ephemeraptera. And as Candy mentioned earlier, they are grazers of algae and detritus. And as Phoebe said earlier, they are part of the intolerant or sensitive pollution group. And they range from 3 to 30 millimeters. And there are three defining characteristics as shown on the slide. The first being that they have feathery or plate-like abdominal gills. So that's the place where they um, undergo respiration and there's many trachea there. The second thing is that they have one like they kind of look like toenails, but they're like one little like tarsal claw at the end of each of their legs. And the third thing is that they usually contain three tails, but sometimes they can contain two. And a cool thing I found about mayflies were that they go through a submiago phase or a done phase, which is shown um, right before they become adults. So this is where they're not, they're out of the water, but they're not sexually mature. So they therefore need to molt again in order to become full grown adults. And then once they become adults, they spend only three days um, mating and then they pass away. So hence the name ephemera, which means short lived and then tero, which means wings. So next we'll be talking about stoneflies or otherwise known as Plecoptera. So they're really similar and related to mayflies in that they both have six legs and they're roughly around six to 60 millimeters long. And so of their six legs, they also have two tails and two tarsal claws within the legs that help them 
break down material and that's important because these guys here don't have any mouths. And another distinguishing factor is that they have branching gills um, on their bodies that resemble hairy armpits and that these gills help them breathe underwater. And so because stoneflies are highly sensitive to polluted waters, they've found coping mechanisms to help them survive. So a cool thing I found about stonefly nymphs were that they flex their arms. So similar to like a push-up motion, when the water is either has low oxygen in it or is slow paced. And in adult stoneflies, they move their back their lower body around to allow their gills to get oxygen. Next are our caddis flies. They're in the order uh, Trichoptera. Um, it consists of case making, net spinning, and free living caddis flies. So the net spinning caddis flies are in the somewhat sensitive group, whereas the case making and free living are in the sensitive group. Um, and their characteristics, their most distinctive feature is their worm-like body. It's kind of reminiscent of a caterpillar. Um, they also have two anal hooks on the back of their um, abdomen that are connected to two uh, pro legs or like false legs. And it just helps them grab onto the substrate or their cases um, to move around. And also assisting with movement is their six jointed legs. Um, and they'll, there'll be three on each side. So the net spinning, sorry, the net spinning caddis flies, as you saw earlier, uh, Candy talked about, they create like a silk retreat um, and they uh, are able to grab things off of it um, to eat. So all caddis flies are able to spin some type of silk. The case making caddis flies um, have similar characteristics or have the same characteristics, but they uh, make cases that they live in for their whole lives or most of their larval stage, and they're able to spin their silk around um, materials found in the substrate and uh, carry them around with them with those uh, two anal hooks uh, on their prolegs. So um, a fun fact about these guys is that their jewelry or jewelry can be made from their cases. If you give them kind of like precious stones or uh, jewels or things, they'll spin them into cases instead of uh, kind of substrate rocks. <laughs> and also their uh, cases are ecological wave stations. Things like algae and mites and other microbes will attach to the outside of their cases. And also some wasp species will um, actually parasitize them. They'll lay their eggs inside of the cases and then when they hatch, they'll eat the caddis fly and live in the case for a little bit. Yeah. So the next group now that we're going to go into are the beetle group or coleoptera. So that includes water penny larvae, which are part of the sensitive group, beetle larvae, um, which is in the sun somewhat sensitive group, and then riffle beetles, which are one of the only adult macroinvertebrates that we'll be looking at. So first we're gonna look at water pennies um, and much like their name, they are in that copper color, they're round. Um, so quite akin to pennies, although they're around a fourth of the size of the standard US penny. Um, they are notable due to their very flattened body. Um, and this is important because they're clingers. They'll cling to rocks and they will scrape off the stuff that's growing on it to consume it. And due to their streamlined body, the water won't be able to push them off the rocks, which is nice. Um, they have no wing pads and they have six little legs that are underneath them. Um, so next we're going to go into beetle larvae. So even though water pennies were beetle larvae, um, these ones look probably much more like, almost like the caddis flies we looked at. Um, they have a distinct head with two little antenna. They have no wing pads and they're quite variable in size between two and 60 millimeters. Although there are a lot of beetle larvae, these are the ones that you're most likely going to find and are actually the larval stage of the last beetle, the last beetle that we're going to look at. So this is an adult riffle beetle. Um, so this is the adult form of what we just saw, and they're also quite small. So they only grow to be one to eight millimeters, um, and they do have full wings. So instead of wing pads, they have full wings that are grown under these hard shells and protected there. And I found some fun facts about riffle beetles that I would love to share with you. So riffle beetles are interesting because 
they, once they mature into adults, they can fly, they have full wings. So for a brief period of time, they will stay out of the water, they'll fly around before they decide that, you know, the water is the place for me. They'll go back to the water and their wings will actually disintegrate and waste away and they'll live the rest of their life there. So super interesting because we don't see a lot of macros that in their adult form decide to go back to the water because most of them do have those silky wings that make them much more uh, adapt for flying. Another cool fact that I found is they have this body part called a plastron, which I find super interesting. And so once these ripple beetles return to the water, these body parts are so efficient at capturing oxygen, they will never need to return to the surface again. So even though they did have a brief period of time where they could be outside, they decide that they're going to stay in the water and they have perfectly evolved to stay there, which I thought was super interesting. So we have reached our midpoint. Um, so we're going to take a five minute bio break. Go get yourself some water, go get a snack. Um, we'll see you in five minutes. I think we can go ahead. All right, the next group that we're going to be looking at is crustaceans and they are in the moderately pollution intolerant group. All right, so we're gonna be looking at crayfish first. Um, so some people like to call them freshwater lobsters because they do resemble them a lot. They are usually around a couple inches long, but until they're fully grown, the juveniles are usually a little bit smaller. So they have 10 legs, eight of these are the small jointed legs that you can see in the picture and two of those are the large pincers or claws. Um, they also have two pairs of antennae, one are larger and one is smaller. The smaller pair, uh, you can probably see in the picture, but they're probably going to be a little harder to see in person. Another identifying feature is the rostrum, which is a large spike that sticks out over the head between the eyes of the crayfish. They also have a segmented tail that's divided into four segments with a telson or a torso in the middle of those segments. They usually range from shades of brown to olive green in color. So the next species is a scud. So that's on the top right of the screen. So scuds have a comma-like body shape that's flattened from side to side. They're usually about five to 20 millimeters long and they have two antenna. They have 14 legs and a hard exoskeleton. So the next species is a sow bug. So they're kind of shaped like a bean with the small legs under their armor, armored plates. The armored plates kind of resemble an armadillo because of the way they're layered. So they also have 14 legs. They have two pairs of antenna, but only one is visible to the naked eye. The other is pretty small. They are gray, orange, or brown in color and usually about one centimeter long. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about the rusty crayfish for just a few minutes. Um, this is an invasive species of crayfish that you might see in your sampling as they're pretty common to the area. They are more aggressive um, than the types that are native to PA. They take their habitat, eat fertilized native crayfish eggs, and eat resources that natives use as food as well. And they also hybridize with natives. So because of these things, they compete with native species and therefore cause a decline in their populations. So the rusty crayfish are usually three to five inches long. They're brown to a grayish color on their body, and they have those signature um, red spots on the side of their bodies when they are mature. They have dark black bands on the tips of, tips of their pinchers or claws. Um, and a way that you can tell the difference between a rusty crayfish and a native species is that the rusty crayfish usually have really smooth claws, whereas native species will have more bumps on them. Um, and they won't be as smooth. And another way that you can tell is that when a rusty crayfish's claws are closed, it'll have a distinct oval gap in the middle that native species won't have. All righty, so next we're going to talk about mollusks, which are some of my favorite. And as you can see on the form here, mollusks are actually in each group. So it really depends on what mollusk you find. 
And we can define this group as our snails, limpets, clams, and mussels with the identif identifying features of all having a hard shell with a soft body inside. So we're gonna look at three different types today. First, we have our gilled snails. Gilled snails have a sealed body inside the shell. They have this thing called an operculum. This is acting like a trap door or a lid for their body. It'll protect them from drying up or from any predators. They also have their shell opening on the right. So you could see them being called um, right opening or right hand snails. Then we have our lunged snail in the middle. Our lunged snails do not have this operculum or trap door and their shell opening is usually on the left. So they're left opening um, snails. And then we have the clam, which are made of two separate shells. Um, and what's really cool is they have these rings on them. They are growth rings. So you can count them like a tree uh, to determine age. And then they have their soft body on the inside. So one of the key differences between the gilled snail and the lung snail is how they are getting their oxygen. Um, so for the lung snail is through a hole. Um, and they're going to have it into their body like a, it's a lung. So you're breathing it in. They're using the dissolved oxygen or oxygen like a lung from the top of the water. Um, so they only have to come to the surface periodically. They're not getting any oxygen from the water. They're getting it from the atmosphere. Um, and so because of that, they can stay down in the water longer. Uh, and some of them are actually adapted for lower levels of dissolved oxygen uh, because some of them do actually get oxygen from small amounts of water. So using this lung, they typically will only get it from the air and therefore they're going to be more tolerant to any kind of pollution in the water. Whereas with our gilled snails, they're going to get their oxygen from the water through dissolved oxygen. And it moves, they, they use a mechanism just like fish with gills um, and that it'll take it out of the water as it filters through. And because of that, they're gonna be more susceptible to any kind of water pollution that could diminish that resource of dissolved oxygen. And then I would be amiss if I did not talk about the invasive zebra mussel. Um, if you do find this at your site, please let us know immediately. Um, but the zebra mussels are spreading within the Pennsylvania Great Lakes region. Um, they have been found in the Susquehanna River watershed, but these can be defined by their letter shape D and their alternating light and dark bands of color. And one of the big issues with them is that they are tight clinging and clumping organisms. So they'll clog pipes. If you've got boats, they'll clog up any kind of motors or anything on the bottom. And then one issue with aquatic species is that they'll grow on top of them and eventually overcome them. So a mollusk we don't quite want in our waterways. Odonata. This order is consisting of uh, both damselflies and dragonflies. However, the dragonflies are not part of the EPA protocol that we use. So the damselfly nymphs are what you guys are looking for. Um, they have some distinct characteristics, although they do uh, look a little bit like mayflies. So we'll kind of get into some distinctions there. So they have a thin body. Their head is the widest part of their body. Um, and on their head, they have a labial mask, which is uh, across their mouth and it folds back. Um, they also have six jointed legs with two tarsal claws at the end, which is a distinction from mayflies, which only have one. They have wing pads on the back of their thorax, which will eventually develop into wings when they become adults. And finally, three uh, flat feather-like gills on the back of their abdomen, um, which are similar to mayflies. They have three cerci though, which are kind of um, more rigid tails, whereas these are gills, which will help them um, to respirate oxygen. So some of these things um, help them with uh, hunting. So their labial mask and their um, six-jointed uh, legs with claws at the end. Um, 
help them to be really, really efficient uh, hunters. And they're actually going to catch about 95% of their prey, as opposed to things like lions and tigers, which will catch anywhere from like 25 to 40%. So there's a video here of them eating. And you can see here the labial mask is unfolding and they'll be able to catch things pretty effectively. Alrighty, so the next group that we're gonna look at is Megaloptera. Um, so this includes helgramites or Dobson flies, which are part of our sensitive group. And then it also includes fish flies and alder flies, which are part of our somewhat sensitive group. So looking at Dobson flies first, um, as far as Megaloptera in general goes, they do have some similar characteristics that we'll see between all three of them, including six jointed legs, um, which are only important because they have these lateral filaments that go along the rest of their body. So the only things that are true legs are the things that are in the front. And then these are their lateral filaments, and they also have a pinching mouth part. So as far as Dobson flies go, they have, they're quite dark in color. As you can see here, it's almost like a dark brown. Um, they do a very clearly defined chewing mouth parts that come out of their front. And they also have um, gills that go under these filaments, again, almost like armpit hair. Um, so Dobson flies are also known as helgramites. So you might hear it both ways. So I found a couple of fun facts about Dobson flies that I'd love to share. Um, one of which being a cool adaptation that I found that the egg sacs actually have evolved to look like bird poop, which I find a, as a really interesting um, evolutionary tactic to ensure that as many offspring um, are able to hatch as possible. Because if I was an animal, this is not what I'd be looking for as my next meal. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting way to ensure success. Additionally, oh, it's not, give me one second. Um, Additionally, Helgramites have also learned how to play a pretty cool trick, um, much like some of our pets potentially at home. So in watching this video, you're first gonna see the gills flapping on their side, which helps give them oxygen. And I'm going to fast forward it a little bit. And we're going to then see the little trick that they have learned over time. So they've actually learned how to play dead. So when threatened, they will roll over onto their backs and stay still for a little while. And then when the threat passes, they will flip on over, scuttle away, and hope for the best. So I thought it was quite interesting, the different adaptations that these um, bugs have figured out over time. So back to this. Awesome. So now we're going to look at fish flies. So fish flies are a little different in the fact that they, instead of being that dark brown color, are reddish tan and often have these yellow streaks. So they're more vibrant in color. Um, they, they also have these lateral filaments going on their sides, although they no longer have, they don't have the gills that go underneath them. So that's one distinction from the Dobson flies. Um, they're around the same size, however, and they have these little claws at the end of their body. So now we're gonna look at the adult form of a fish fly, which I also thought was kind of interesting. So we're getting two fun facts for this one, but it's okay. Um, so this is the adult form. They are, they look pretty dinosaur-esque to me and they have been around for a very, very long time. Megaloptera actually means large winged, which as you can see, they have very large wings. And ironically, these large wings over time have not made them smooth flyers. One of the identification features of their adults, which is an additional fun fact, is the fact that they are very clumsy. They're notably one of the more clumsy insects as they fly around. They seem haphazard. Um, so these large wings don't help them fly any better, but this is how they evolved to be. And the last one in this group we're looking at is elder flies. So again, they have these lateral filaments along their side, except for elder flies, instead of the claws at the end of their body, they have this one terminal filament that almost looks like a tail. Um, and they are also much smaller than both Dobson flies and fish flies. So we have Dobson flies that are dark in color with the gills. We have fish flies that are bright in color without the gills. And then we have alder flies that are smaller than the other two. All right, so the next group that we're gonna be looking at is worms. And they are in the group that is not very sensitive to pollution. 
Um, okay, so first we'll start off with aquatic worms. So they're pretty identifiable from their shape. They have soft bodies that are really long and cylindrical with ring-like segments on them. They're usually reddish to white in color. And on average, they are about one to 30 millimeters long, but they can reach up to 150 millimeters long. So next is the leeches. Um, leeches are wide, flat, segmented worms with suction-like appendages on each side of their body. They're usually about 15 to 20 millimeters long, but they can grow up to 10 inches long. And they're usually black or brown in color, but their body can be pretty colorful. So um, <clears throat> a fun fact about leeches is that they have a special kind of saliva that prevents clot formation and in less than 30 minutes, they can uh, draw up to 10 times their own body weight in blood. Um, so that's about five to 10 millimeters of blood. So that's pretty cool. All right. And last but not least are our true flies, the diptera order. Um, so, Diptera is a very, very large and diverse uh, group of bugs. So di meaning two and terra meaning wings. So these are identified by having two wings in the adults. Um, there are 17,000 species of flies in North America with 3,500 of those being aquatic larvae, which is a large amount. So it's hard for us to summarize all of the information about them at once, but we're gonna look at some few examples. So you look at the lower left, it says all have. So all of these um, diptera, they have no defined legs. They might have some fake legs, but no defined legs, no wing pads, um, and they're variable, but they'll all will be this soft body worm-like uh, worm -like creature. So first up is we do have our midge larva. They have a distinct head and you might be like, I've seen that head before. Uh, it kind of looks like a caddisfly if you don't take a closer look to see that it doesn't actually have any jointed legs, uh, but it has what we call those pro legs or fake legs on it. And its body is similar in thickness all the way down. And then we have our black fly larvae. They should look familiar from earlier. We saw a video of them feeding. So you, they have this distinct head. They've got these fans to help them eat. Um, and that end of the body that's wider, that's where that hook is gonna be for them to be in the water and casually eat their prey. And then our black fly or crane fly larvae. Um, so they have a small head. They don't have any defined head, but they do have these fleshy protrusions at the end of their body. So they're pretty well identifiable from that. And we'll see with adults in this group is that they are also very diverse, especially with their mouth parts, so how they actually eat. So they, uh, entomologists actually suspect that their feeding uh, adaptations have arisen from more than a single evolutionary origin. So we can break this down though into two different ways of acquiring fluids, cutting and piercing, which many of us have probably been victims of, um, and sponging and lapping, which you might have actually seen in your kitchen. Uh, so this cutting or piercing is typically for tissues of a host, um, most of them being external parasites. They'll feed on bloods of their uh, vertebrate hosts, including humans and most wild and domestic animals. This includes the everlasting mosquitoes, biting midges, um, noceums, and most black flies. And then this sponging or lapping adaptation is for surviving on any kind of honeydew, nectar, um, or secretions of various plants or animals, whether that be dead or alive. Examples of these would include crane flies and soldier flies. So very diverse group, um, and they're usually pretty pollution tolerant. Oh my goodness, does anyone recognize themselves in this photo? 
feels like it was probably years ago what well, was so that was all of our macro vertebrate identification for the evening and i'm going to click snooze because my computer wants to restart um so you've made it through the identification portion. I wanna reiterate, we do not expect you to memorize all of that. This is the tip of the iceberg and we will be doing this hands-on at our workshop, which I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about. And we're gonna go forth into the next slide, perfect. So one of the best ways of learning about macros is in the field, having the equipment to collect them and seeing them live. And so it's similar to our chemical monitoring is we will be giving you loan equipment to be able to do this macroinvertebrate monitoring. Um, in addition to the kit, you might need to, you will need to purchase a fishing license prior to going out in the field, but we'll let you know before. Uh, but we give you all the tools you need to collect and identify. And so one thing that we can start doing now before our workshops, hopefully in the spring, I'm gonna manifest it, hopefully in the spring, is thinking about whether your monitoring site um, would be a great site for doing macroinvertebrate monitoring. So we can start assessing what we have there. The first thing is safety. Similar to chemical monitoring, we want you to be safe. Um, but some of you might not enter your stream. And for macroinvertebrate monitoring, you actually have to enter your stream. So there's a few considerations that we have that are different from chemical monitoring. So you wanna make sure it's safe, not very high flow, you're able to get in easily, not too um, fast either. And so we wanna look at easy entrance to water. Are you able to step in well, not too fast, not too high? We want that lower flow so that you're not being pushed over or any waders aren't being coming waterlogged. And then we also want to look at that macroinvertebrate habitat. So we want to look for these riffle zones in the stream, which are areas where it's a little shallower, the water's moving faster. Some of you might have seen this activity at the top of your top of different streams where you see that white um, fast velocity zones. That's that riffle. Um, and so you want to have that typically will be in a rocky bottom around some sort of large debris. We want to have those because that's where the macroinvertebrates are going to hang out. You also want to have a wide bank. It's really helpful for us to be able to take our net out of the water and be able to sort organisms on the side of the bank to have that type of accessible bank. And then we want to be upstream of any bridges um, or man-made structures. We want to do that so we're getting a naturally representative portion of the stream and of the community. And some of you might be thinking, this does not fit my site whatsoever. And that's fine because there's different criteria for this. Um, so I suggest is start thinking about other stretches or reaches of your site um, on the stream or the, ri the li river that might be best for you to be able to monitor. So if you're like, okay, not at this intersection, but two intersections down, that's a good spot upstream of that bridge. That might be a potential for doing macroinvertebrates. But if nowhere, nowhere on your stream where you monitor is going to work, then we can have you join another team for this one-time monitoring. So I want everyone to look at these four pictures. Two of these sites are really great for macroinvertebrate monitoring, uh, and two of them are not quite as, as a great. So you can go ahead and put in the chat which photos you think might work the best. You can call them upper right, lower right, lower left, upper left. We've got lower right, upper right, lower right, upper right, lower right, upper right, uh, lower right, upper left, upper left, lower right. Good. I like how no one's saying lower left. We've all decided lower left is not going to work. 
Yeah, no one wants to go in the lower left. Great. All right, so we are going to focus on the upper right and our lower right. Um, so the site in the upper left, that the stream bank is not very stable there. It's high flow um, or high water level. Um, so it wouldn't be a great place to get in. Uh, not much riffle going on from what we can see. And then the lower left, this was taken during a time of uh, a flooding event. So there's going to be those, this is the yellow breaches. So there's going to be that higher flow um, and it's not going to be safe to get in. And you can see, you can't even see the stream bank in this photo. Uh, so definitely not safe to get in. Our upper right, you can see a nice rocky bottom. There's a person in the picture showing that you can in fact be on the bank safely. Uh, and then our lower right is some of our previous students in the stream and they are able to get in safely and there's lots of riffle. All right. So when you are choosing your site, you're going to identify, um, or when you go to your monitoring site, you're going to identify a reach of 100 feet of where you're going to have three different riffle zones, which is represented by the monitors in the photo here. All the way downstream, we've got one, and then two, and three. So they are all collecting macros in three riffle zones in this 100-foot reach area. And when you're collecting the macros, you'll have two, at least two people, great to have three, so you have a timer. One person will be holding the net and another person will be doing the macro kick, which will comprise of disturbing the stream bed um, and rubbing off any rocks. The idea is to be able to get into the stream and be able to dislodge any macros and let them flow downstream into the net so we can capture them. Um, some people call this the macro shuffle, the dance or kick. The idea though is to disturb the sediment and dislodge any macros. After your kicks, you're gonna carefully lift up that net so we don't let any wash downstream. And then this is where you'll start picking directly from the net. Anything that's moving, you're gonna take that and put it into water. We are not preserving these macros. We wanna to try to keep them alive. Um, but anything that's moving, it takes, as you can see, it takes a lot of hands to make sure we get them all. If you find any crayfish, you're going to record those and return them to the stream. And then unless it's invasive, we're not returning that. Um, and if you get any fish, uh, amphibians, or reptiles, sometimes that happens, you're also going to return those. And then we'll go through a process um, of organizing them by groups. So you're going to organize them by these characteristics we talked about tonight, like features, get ones that look like all together in different, or in different dividers in these water-filled containers. You'll then ID them using resources we'll give you and macroinvertebrates will be very, or oh my goodness, uh, magnifying glasses, I'm mixing them up, I've got macros on the mind, magnifying glasses will be really helpful at this point to see some of those features and then you'll tally and record what you find. So the tally sheet you saw earlier throughout the presentation, it's based on the EPA volunteer monitoring program, and it's built to show presence and absence of the different indicator groups that Candy mentioned that we talked about and the diversity that they represent. Your finished tally sheet would look something like this, where you have a total number of each organism and then a code which represents their abundance. And our ultimate goal is to use the macros we found to come up with a single score that'll represent the level of water quality. This score will take into account the pollution sensitivity of all the indicator groups and the diversity of what co we collected. Um, and so, for example, to take into account the different sensitivities, the groups that are more sensitive are going to contribute more to this score. You want a higher score. so. If you have more sensitive species, they're going to add more to that score. And overall, this represents knowing who's there, what indicator groups, 
and how many different kinds of those groups there are. And remember, this will all be to done hands-on in the field. You're not expected to remember this. And we will walk through this scoring sheet together. So now I'm gonna pass it to Jenny, who will talk about some next steps and resources for you. Fantastic. Okay, so for those of you who are interested in learning more about macroinvertebrates uh, before the workshops in the spring, we have both an indoor and an outdoor suggestion to check out. The first one we're gonna talk about is something that you can do indoors, which is perfect um, for the winter time. So you can do a simple web search uh, to find more information on macros. There's a lot of information out there, a lot of good pictures. Um, and one website that I'm gonna show you quickly and go through is this website called macroinvertebrates.org. And this website is the result of a collaborative project that's been funded by the National Science Foundation. And you'll see here that there's lots of different high resolution photos of different orders of the common freshwater macros that are found in Eastern North America. So from this home page, you can click on one of these orders. We'll take a look at stoneflies. And when you click on the order page, you will see the different families and genera that are in the database on this website. And I believe that they have 150 organisms at the, at the moment. So here we are looking at stoneflies. And if you look over here onto the right hand side, you'll see these three tabs. And the first one that pops up are the diagnostic characteristics. So those are the things that we just talked about that um, those characteristics that are unique to stoneflies, the things that you'll use to look for, the features to help to identify them. There's also this information tab right here, and it will give you an overview of the order itself, as well as the life history. Um, you can read more about the stonefly. And then this third tab over here is the media tab. And so it'll have, uh, videos, it'll have photos from iNaturalists about stoneflies in general. You can also go and look at a family, a specific family by clicking on it here, and it will show these are all of the um, stoneflies that fall in the common stoneflies. And over here on the right are, is the same thing. So now the media is only showing you videos and photographs of the common stonefly. In the middle are the diagnostic characteristics of those stoneflies. And then the information tab is about this particular family. It'll give you characteristics um, such as their feeding habit habits and their movement within the water. And lastly, you can click on an individual genus and it'll do the same thing over here on the right. So it's gonna talk about this particular genus. It will give you the diagnostic characteristics and it, the, um, there aren't many media um, photos or videos for the genus themselves. It's mostly limited to the families and the order. But for any of these macros, you can zoom in really closely and see the fine detail um, that you only get from these um, good high resolution photographs and you can zoom out as well. Um, you can flip the organisms over too to look at the underside. And if you click this middle tab for these diagnostic characteristics, it'll actually show It'll actually bring up these tabs on the photo for you to take a um, close look at. So the you can also you can always go back to the home page to look at a different order or a different family or up here in the upper left you can go through and toggle between them. Um, so if we wanted to choose the true flies, we could um, choose them from here, or you can always click here to go back to the home screen. 
This website is really helpful when you are trying to identify the macroinvertebrates that you have found. And one thing I'm gonna show you right here is this blue ID key. If you click this, this will bring up a dichotomous key that will ask you a series of questions um, and take you through this to help you identify the order of the macroinvertebrate you found. And what's really nice about this digital version of this key is you can click on this box and it will show you um, pictures of what it's asking you as well as define what the term is. So if you weren't, if you started here and it asks you, are you jointed legs and you're not sure what jointed legs were, you click it and it'll tell you what a jointed leg is as well as show you pictures of what that means. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of different um, things that you can go through over here. There's more resources and uh, there is a practice quiz. So if you get really into studying different types of macros and you want to try um, seeing what your identification skills are, there is a practice quiz. But um, we will, this website is really helpful for identifying macros. And next we're going to talk about an outdoor option. So there are two things that you can do outdoors. The first thing is you can go to your monitoring site <clears throat> and see if it's an appropriate site for sampling macros uh, following this EPA volunteer monitoring protocol um, and looking for some of the features that Stephanie just talked about. If it's easy to get into your site, if it is, um, if there's a rocky bottom and riffle areas, and we encourage you to take photographs of your site um, and then you can send those photos to Stephanie or upload them to the stream team Facebook page. And that will be helpful when it comes time for the workshop to uh, figure out if your site is a good place to monitor or if you need to look at an um, alternative location or join another team. The other thing that you can do when you're at the site is to explore the site and see if you can find any macros that are living there. And one of the easiest way to do that is to find rocks or sticks or piles of leaves that are in the water and pick them up and rub the rocks or the sticks or the leaves with your hands or use tweezers um, to pull the macroinvertebrates off. And what's really helpful is if you bring a, um, a separate container, like a shallow container with you, you can put the macros into the container to make it easier to see. And if you happen to have a magnifying glass at home, that would be great to bring along. Um, so you can take the macros from the rocks and the sticks and the leaves and put them in the container and then take a close look and look and see if you can see any of the features that we talked about um, today to see if you can identify what type of macro you found. And taking a photo of what you find would be useful as well, because then you can also look at that photo at home using that macroinvertebrate.org website uh, to see what you did find. You wanna be sure to return the macros um, back to the stream when you're done. Uh, but this is, these are a couple of options of things that you can do in the meantime before the workshop. So check out the website or any other website. There's lots of good ones out there. Um, also visit your stream, see if it's a good place to sample macroinvertebrates this spring, and then try to see if you can find any living in your site. And, you know, it doesn't, you know, for that last part, it doesn't even have to be at your exact um, monitoring site. It can be at any stream. It's always fun to get in and see what's living there. And you can email the photos to Stephanie, or you can upload the photos to the uh, Stream Team Facebook group. And if you're not a member of the group already, we encourage you to join. And I think now we have time for questions. Yeah, so feel free to drop your questions in the chat or to unmute yourself, um, and we'll answer as many questions as we can before we run out of time.
see some suggestions in the chat for different apps to look at. I didn't know the macro website had an app, so that's pretty cool as well. Yeah, the Creek Critters app. Um, I'm pretty sure Audubon Natural Society. I could be wrong. Didn't they create that? Yeah. I should know. Yeah, I that's the Audubon. <laughs> yeah, it is a good app. Any other questions, comments? got some more, more pictures for you besides the uh video i sent you oh yeah yeah please send them yeah i got them from paul i was waiting for him and said send them to me that way i can practice <laughs> so. tamala says iNaturalist yeah yeah there's definitely people doing macros on iNaturalist Pocket Macro Invertebrates. That's the app. Cool. Definitely something I'll be downloading. <laughs> yeah, and it's supposed to rain tomorrow. So if you're trying to go out on Saturday, just a warning that sometimes after rain. a big rain event, they might be washed out. So maybe give it a few days after this rain. Holly can't wait to collect. I know. I wish it wasn't raining tomorrow. I'd want to get out tomorrow for it. Be careful with creeks in the phone. The phones with the creek. Yes, please don't drop your phone in. Yes, yes. Yes, we will definitely be doing the macros in teams. Um, that is a good point, Tina. Holly, great question. Anytime after, around April, I think is when we're aiming, March, April, May, probably April. Don't quote me, but those are three months within the time frame. <laughs> I, I'll tell you right now, not February. <laughs> Which is good. It'll warm up just a little bit before we go out. It's on Thursday evenings. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you for telling us, Holly. Kids are useful for the kicks. I went out monitoring with kids before and their enthusiasm is fantastic for the macro kick. <laughs> We do have a few more minutes here for any questions that come in. There are a few we can stop sharing probably so I can see everyone's lovely ah, faces. Wonderful. Way too cold in March. Yeah, it's a little, a little chilly. Well, if we don't have any other questions, then we'll end for the night. Thank you, Gil. Thank you for being here. And thank you everyone for being here. It was so great to see you all. This has been really fun for us, at the alarm team to work on this and to be able to provide you with this enriching, enriching educational moment. And we are so excited to be able to be with you in the spring and actually be looking at these macros together and be in the stream. So Thank you for being here and we will see you see you soon.